South or I have two weeks old, probably sit down and come to you. Welcome back to our, our second session. Uh, we're going to talk about Shakespeare and a little bit of theater. Uh, I want to begin with a quotation uh, from a woman named Janet McSpear. This is from a Chicago magazine. The use of this called City Talk. It's from May 25th, 2001, an article by Ian Warren Wolfoff and Janet McSpear. And that's just a series of uh, the Shakespeare play in the Chicago area. And in this interview, we learn uh, the actress has never been seen on doing big Hollywood movies. This she says, quote, all seem to be about making money, and I don't find that terribly interesting. Today in our world, art has to be commercial. That's a really sad point of view. If Shakespeare had had to be commercial, he wouldn't have written the things he did. And that's at least amazing. Uh, it just shows you how deeply ingrained this cultural myth of the isolated artist in our culture uh, is. Shakespeare was a fully commercial artist working in a fully commercial theater. Uh, uh, and indeed, he uh, exhibit A for my whole case. Uh, if you can probably say that uh, great commercial art is possible, you just have to point to Shakespeare. Please close the way we can all go home right now. Uh, Shakespeare is the greatest writer who ever lived. He's probably the greatest artist uh, who ever lived. And he worked in a commercial environment. If that was possible, there can't be anything fundamentally wrong uh, with uh, a commercial basis for art. So in a way, we could stop here. But let's try to uh, explicate that. Uh, uh, and my aim this afternoon is to show that yes, Shakespeare operated in a commercial environment, and I want to show that much of his achievement was because of that and not in spite of that. That is, you could say uh, yes, Shakespeare worked in a commercial environment, but he overplayed it, and in a certain sense that is true. Uh, uh, and I, I'm certainly not going to say that. Uh, uh, a commercial environment produced Shakespeare because there was only one Shakespeare. Uh, and if we could credit his achievement to commerce, then there should have been a whole bunch of Shakespeare running around in the day. And there were so many people who were trying to be Shakespeare or trying to be great playwrights at the time, and they didn't quite succeed, or at least didn't succeed the way Shakespeare did. So I'm not claiming that the commercial environment was responsible for Shakespeare. But nevertheless, I want to point to aspects of the theater of the day that were genuinely commercial and that contributed to the season. Above all, competition. That's one of the principles uh, I want to talk about this whole week. You could say the, uh, the dream of artists themselves and much of the left wing uh, program for art is to steal the artist from competition. Oh, how horrible the competitive marketplace is. You see, it's the same argument they make in basic economics. Competition is bad. Uh, uh, and if you could only eliminate the competitive aspect of culture, you would have so much better a culture. Uh, well, it is true that nobody likes competition. Even Shakespeare is probably that fancy about Marlowe and Ben Johnson at times. And everyone sort of dreams about eliminating the competition. But the answer is that's not healthy. It's not healthy in basic economics. It's not healthy on an arguing culture uh, as well. Uh, just as in basic economics, competition is healthy for culture. It, 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 it keeps people on their toes. It takes their best work out of them. And I think the Elizabethan theater uh, is uh, an excellent uh, example now. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the the cultural environment uh, that Shakespeare was working in. Uh, uh, Renaissance theater in England, Elizabethan theater, Jacobean theater, that's the two periods uh, under Queen Elizabeth and under James I. This is one of the peaks of world drama, uh, uh, probably the greatest uh, body of dramatic work of a few peaks that Shakespeare uh, 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 is working at that uh, uh, time. 
Uh, and it was a largely commercial operation. In fact, it's interesting, it's just a good example uh, of the fundamental thing I was talking about uh, this morning, uh, that a certain economic stage had to be used as the precondition uh, for the Elizabethan theater. Uh, Shakespeare, Gloria Sutton, Stratford, seeing strolling players coming to the town, might have dreamed of being the world's greatest playwright. Uh, but without a theater and an acting company, he wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and he was not in a position uh, to fund that himself, to pay for building a theater or hiring uh, an acting company. Uh, and uh, thank goodness that Bill Joseph Frank and Aiden said that was going to assign the money uh, for this, that they probably would not have given it to Shakespeare. Uh, uh, so what he had to approach was an already established uh, uh, commercial theater world in London, which was predicated on the fact that London, by that time, in the 1880s, was one of the largest uh, cities in Europe, was a great commercial center uh, already, uh, uh, therefore had generated surplus wealth so that people could uh, uh, spend money uh, uh, on something as frivolous as entertainment. Uh, again, in, uh, in, in Stratford, where Shakespeare grew up, people weren't going to spend their hard-earned money on a play, at least not maybe once a year. But in London, you had a situation where there was enough economic wealth so uh, people could go to the theater uh, regularly. Now, it took entrepreneurs to figure that out. Uh, uh, the government didn't build the theaters. Even the aristocrats uh, didn't build the theater, uh, theaters. There had been already a kind of tradition of uh, acting troops appearing at aristocratic houses, staging plays and holidays in the big hall and one of these large aristocratic houses. Uh, but the theater that Shakespeare knew uh, was a commercial. Uh, theater in London. Uh, uh, theater started to be built, I believe, in the 1560s, maybe a little later. Uh, but it was quite an investment. Uh, you had to, uh, first of all, build a theater. Uh, and some of you may have seen the replica of the globe that we now have uh, in London. Uh, uh, these were large theaters. They sat not full sure, between 2,000 maybe. 3,000 people, including seeing and, and standing. Uh, the first um, uh, was built by a man named Burbage, whose son went on to become Shakespeare's leading actor, Richard Burbage. Uh, 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 so it, uh, it took basically a four sided entrepreneur uh, to, to see that there was an economic opportunity here. Uh, that if you invested the money, uh, rather large sums of money in those days, to build one of these theaters, uh, uh, you could get enough people to come to it to justify your investment. Uh, the greatest expense was in building the theater. Uh, uh, the Elizabethan theaters uh, initially were outdoors. They didn't have uh, scenery in our modern sense. Uh, they did uh, have rather elaborate costuming, uh, uh, and that cost money, although in many cases, and here, an element of aristocratic station is entered the picture, uh, the theaters were often connected with a major aristocrat or even a, a venture with the royal court, and often as part of that connection, they got some kind of cast off aristocratic outfit. So they could dress up in robes and look like kings and queens. Uh, uh, without really buying the stuff, but they were kind of uh, using hand me down uh, from their aristocratic uh, patrons. Uh, but anyway, it was by, uh, by Elizabethan standards, by Renaissance standards, uh, uh, the theater business was rather heavily capitalized, involved major uh, uh, investment, and in fact, the uh, theater companies were among the first joint stock company. Uh, they actually had shareholders. Shakespeare eventually became a shareholder uh, in 
uh, the theater company he was involved in. Uh, was, uh, he got a percentage of the growth. He got a really good Hollywood deal uh, on his play. Uh, so there really was quite an economic underpinning uh, uh, to the field. Again, uh, if England hadn't, if London hadn't reached a certain stage of economic prosperity at this point, uh, uh, nothing would have been possible. And so basically the theaters uh, were commercial operations. They were open to the general public, and that means uh, uh, basically uh, the middle class and the lower classes you know, have totally active records on the people that attend these plays, but it does uh, we get indications that professionals like lawyers seem to have gone to the theater uh, a lot then and often provided legal advice to the theater companies that often get in trouble. But but uh, 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 daily working men would go to the uh, uh, theater. I believe the price uh, was about a penny, which was an hour's wage then. And it's kind of curious how the basic entertainment has stayed at about minimum wage. If you think of what a uh, movie ticket costs now, uh, it's, it's roughly one hour's wage. And, and, and the addition the, the to the receiver was roughly uh, one hour's wage for the, the average person. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the theaters, in other words, uh, appeal to a broad spectrum uh, uh, of the populace of London. Uh, they uh, were all built initially outside the city limits of London. Uh, London is a fast growing metropolis. And now it was then uh, a, a lot of small walled little medieval city. It actually corresponds to what's called the city in London now. If you know London is geography, it's the financial district, uh, what's called the city roughly corresponds. You can still see the old walls at some point. And the theaters were built outside the theater city limits because the uh, civic authority. Uh, we're not too thrilled with theater. They, they, uh, some of the, the, the London authorities were relatively middle class, some with certain sympathies, and so they, uh, uh, many of them uh, subscribed to the certain objections to the theater that uh, involved too much sex and it was uh, corrupt and men dressed up as women uh, and, 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 and so on. And so uh, the theaters couldn't get licenses within the city limits of London. And moreover, they, they wanted to build the theaters outside the jurisdiction of the city fathers of London. And they also tended to have some aristocratic protection. Uh, and here's where the situation gets a little complicated. You can't call the Elizabethan theater purely commercial because there was an element of patronage. Uh, all the theater companies uh, uh, were attached to some prominent aristocrat at court. For example, Shakespeare's company was originally the Lord Chamberlain men. Uh, their representative uh, court was the Lord Chamberlain. Uh, later, they became the King's men when James I came to the throne in 1604. So they, they were the most successful company and they got the highest patronage. Uh, possible the world patronage, and that uh, I don't want to minimize that. Uh, uh, patronage was still important to them uh, when the civic authorities would threaten to close down the theaters or interfere with them. It was very important to have a patron at court uh, who could defend you. Uh, 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 appearances at court were very important. Uh, to Shakespeare's company and the other companies. That is, uh, yes, they performed uh, in these the public theaters uh, and got a uh, uh, substantial portion of income from that. But uh, uh, a command performance at the court was still a big deal. It was financially rewarding. Uh, you often could make more from one performance at the court than you could from the, uh, from the whole run of a play as a public theater. Uh, uh, it was very prestigious. Uh, we can see this 
you know, printing into some of Shakespeare's plays and into printing where they will make a big deal on the how they had performed before his majesty at Whitehall and such and such occasions. Uh, uh, so this is an example of what I was talking about this morning, that we can't always separate the world of patronage from the world of the market. They often blur uh, uh, together. Uh, but so fundamentally, the plays were oriented towards a commercial a theater, and we should see that in what Shakespeare appealed to uh, uh, in the play. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's interesting just to go and just try to think of the status of the play and the status of the playwright of the general then and of Shakespeare's uh, uh, own status. Because uh, there's a lot of retro Shakespeare's retroactive thinking going on. We saw that in this quote from this woman saying that. You know, Shakespeare wouldn't written, have written what he did if he was commercial. Well, now we no longer think of Shakespeare as commercial. Well, as a matter of fact, he's still quite successful commercially as a number of movies have shown. But now we think of Shakespeare as high off. Uh, and this is a kind of optical illusion, a trick of perspective, uh, and it's something I'll be coming back to again and again. Now Shakespeare is one of our quintessential images of high culture. But he was absolutely the pop culture of his day, the most popular playwright uh, of his day. And no one was standing around the Elizabethan period saying, oh, uh, we need to go see Shakespeare, that's high culture. Uh, that was as low as it got then. And what's interesting is if you look at the contemporary reactions uh, to the plays, uh, to the theater in general, even to Shakespeare, uh, is that this was vulgar pop culture stuff. Uh, there were tremendous attacks on the theater during Shakespeare's lifetime, uh, largely coming from the Puritan wing uh, 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 in English Protestantism at the time, which culminated some 50 years later, the Third Revolution, 1540, when the Puritans came to uh, power, one of the first things they did was to shut down the theaters, and they were stuck for a period of about, I think, 18 years. They were reopened in 1650. Eventually, one of the first things uh, Charles II did when he came to the club was reopen the theaters. Uh, so the theater was very contentious, and basically, you got the complaint about Shakespeare's theater in his day that we get about uh, first movies, uh, then television, and now video games. Uh, that is what people said, what they say about any good art form at the beginning, that there was too much sex and violence in it, uh, and people mistook uh, illusion for reality. And they took these plays and things. They couldn't distinguish between what they saw on the stage and, and, and what was real. And again, this is, we see this in Play Over Public, and it's attack on a scene in drama. You can see it today in attacks on video games. It's one consistent point throughout the history of culture that whatever culture is the most popular and has the most impact, there are people who are going to complain about it. Intellectuals are going to complain about it, and moralists are going to complain about it. And Shakespeare here is no example. Now, I don't want to go too far on this. There were people that recognized Shakespeare's genius in his day. A girl, uh, uh, you know, Shakespeare began writing probably in the late 1580s, certainly established by the 1590s. By uh, 1598, a man named Francis Newman was saying in print that this guy Shakespeare is as good as the ancient, that uh, his tragedies are as good as the ancient uh, Greek and uh, Roman tragedies, his comedies are as good uh, as Paulus and Clarence and so on. So, uh, people who were in his day recognized uh, this man's genius. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that he wasn't severely criticized. Uh, in general, the theater was criticized and Shakespeare was criticized. Uh, sometimes by his fellow playwrights uh, who complained he wasn't educated. He was famously called an upstart crow uh, in one contemporary uh, uh, critique uh, uh, because the other playwrights were jealous uh, of him. So it's a good example uh, of uh, what happens 
when we compare the past with the present. Uh, today, uh, Shakespeare, in a way, has been changed from. He's become a classic. He's taught in schools. There's something almost revealing like in our attitude towards him. We know uh, he's a great playwright. We know he's the greatest playwright ever. So we tell him some facts. Uh, there are many people who, if they saw a Shakespeare play and didn't know Shakespeare's written it, would complain bitterly. Uh, again, about the, the, the unending, dirty joke in his comedies and sometimes even in his tragedies as in Hamlet. Or again, the incredible violence. Uh, I, I mean, uh, 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 what video game has more people shot up at the end of Hamlet, uh, percentage-wise? Uh, uh, and so, you know, basically, we come to terms with Shakespeare, uh, and we suddenly forget that in his own day, uh, he had a real powerful charge to him that, that frightened uh, many people, and 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 the the sneer even more general. And it's very typical if you uh, oversee the whole period of one lesson about the transformation of pop culture into high culture. Uh, I, I, uh, the number of plays that have survived from Shakespeare's time is in the hundreds, I believe. We have 37 or 38 plays by Shakespeare. Uh, uh, during his lifetime, about 200 plays total, including his uh, 19 of his that were printed in his lifetime, were printed. Uh, 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 other plays have been found since. Uh, I don't know the exact figure, but uh, uh, probably about 300, 250 to 300 plays survived from uh, the whole period, let's say, roughly from 1580. 1530. Uh, that's a lot of plays, uh, and very few of them are read today, and they are unquestionably represent the tip of iceberg. That most of the plays from the time uh, are as lost uh, as early episodes of My Three Sons. This is, I mean, you know, the uh, when you look at the history of television, it's just staggering how much has been produced. And unfortunately, most of this has been preserved, and we have to live with it in uh, Nick at Night and TV Land. Uh, you know, mercifully, uh, most of the plays, probably a majority of the plays, have been lost. They were maybe produced once and then uh, disappeared. Uh, 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 this is true of Greek tragedy as well. Now, we don't have time to talk much about Greek tragedy, but it's estimated that about a thousand. Uh, tragedies were produced in Athens during roughly that century when, when Athens was uh, producing drama. Uh, of those thousand thirty three plays that survived, uh, uh, seven by Esther, seven by Sophocles, and nineteen by uh, Euripides. Uh, and, you know, when we look back at Greek drama, we justify the look at it as one of the two of dramatic creation, probably the two greatest periods uh, of dramatic creation are uh, 6th century Athens and uh, 16th, 17th century London. Uh, and yet, if we had all those, that entire 1,000 tragedies uh, from ancient Athens, our view of the human tragedy would probably be somewhat different. Uh, uh, you know, we have every reason to believe that the best of the Greek dramas are the ones that are uh, survived. They were survived because they were drunk to be the best, and people went out of the way uh, to praise them. But, you know, uh, there, there was undoubtedly a Quentin Tarantino of the Ephesian drama. There was undoubtedly an Oliver Stone of the Ephesian drama. And mercifully, we have spared those works. But, but, but they were there, and if we saw them, we would probably think less uh, of the tragedy, or at least have a more balanced view. And it's just, uh, with, with uh, Elizabethan Jacobean drama, we have the advantage that uh, almost all of Shakespeare's plays are preserved, thank heaven. Uh, there's indications that maybe one or two, such as so called Cardinio, uh, were lost. 
Uh, but, you know, the world was trying to preserve those. We have wonderful dramas by Chris Lamarra, by Ben Johnson. Uh, you can keep going down the ranks and you get some excellent plays by Thomas Middleton, uh, by Phil Turner, by John Ford. Yeah, he's a decent son. The Jacobean John Ford, that's a filmmaker. Uh, 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 that he's a decent son. The Jacobean John Ford is much more violent than the guy who made the person. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, it's an impressive body of material. When we begin to see uh, the way any real culture is seared in terms of quality, uh, that, you know, in this case, we have the supreme figure of Shakespeare standing above it all. Uh, then we have some still giant figures like Marlowe and Johnson and some lesser figures, and then it sort of it spreads out, and, it, and there's some pretty bad Elizabethan and Jacobean dramas, uh, comedies that aren't funny, tragedies that are completely wacky. Uh, uh, and uh, again, we don't have that kind of material for Greek tragedy, uh, but when we look at the drama of Shakespeare, it starts to look more like the culture of our time, like the history of cinema, for example. Where again, you have some titanic geniuses in the course of the 20th century, people like uh, Pauline and Ingmar Bergman and John Ford and Hitchcock and so And then, you know, you get down, down the line. So, you know, what I'm getting at is any true culture, a real living culture, uh, is based on a pyramid of zombies. I see basically uh, a lot of lousy stuff is turned out. The vast proportion of the Italian culture is lousy. Uh, uh, and you need that range of work in order to produce the, 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 the great achievements of any period. Uh, uh, when people complain about commercial culture today, they have plenty of trash to point to. Uh, thousands of bad movies uh, have been made. Uh, thousands of bad television shows are being shown at any given moment as we speak. But there are peaks of quality. And the problem we have is when people compare the average work of commercial culture today with the peaks of the past, which are now thought of as non commercial, but in fact were part of the commercial culture in their day. And uh, 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 the, I mean, you realize, in fact, that the same environment that produced Shakespeare in his day. You know, he's producing uh, the great movies, the great television shows of our day. That is, you need a very competitive marketplace. Uh, uh, again, I don't have time to talk about Greek drama, but it is interesting that even though you can't call a Athenian theater commercial, but it was competitive. Uh, it was specifically featured and specifically designed as competition. Uh, these uh, great. Uh, dramas we read today, as for the Lord of Fire, as for the Lord of Antigone, and, and the Oedipus Turin, and so on. These were all part of quite literally a competitive system. Uh, and so even though that theater wasn't commercial, it had a very strong competitive element built into it, and the dramas were written for civic uh, dramatic uh, competition. Uh, uh, Elizabethan England didn't have uh, quite that system, but it was a very competitive environment. And what I'm saying is the plays were better for that reason. Uh, that competition spurred innovation, it spurred creativity, uh, it kept people from settling into comfortable uh, ruts. Uh, now, the reason the Portuguese theater was so competitive is it was so entrepreneurial. Uh, there was some barrier to entry that needed enough money to create, uh, build a theater and outfit it and hire actors and uh, hire uh, uh, playwrights and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you could raise the money, uh, you could enter the business, especially since it was a kind of fringe business. Again, it was a very unregulated marketplace. They built the theater specifically outside the city limits so that they were an unregulated zone. Uh, 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 so that, I mean, to, to show how commercial uh, the Elizabethan theater was, 
particularly the South Bank area, where the Globe was eventually uh, built and where Faith has been much of his career. And it's that was the center for fear, air baiting pits, and positive prostitution. And Faith was dead. All the fun activities were concentrated in this one area outside the city. Uh, uh, ironically, the land was under the control of the Bishop of Winchester, I believe, and therefore the city couldn't have been because it was uh, church territory. But uh, the um, uh, uh, bear baiting was this wonderful force for the Elizabethan children of both fighting. They would tie a bear to a stake and stick dogs on it, and people would bet on who won the dog or the bear. Uh, we can have half of get a movie on it. Uh, but, uh, and how's the practice? I don't need to explain. But it is interesting, the number of the people out there were doubled. They ran bordellos as they ran theaters. Burbage uh, was one example uh, of that. I think Philip Honeywell also was in the dual business. Again, this gives some idea uh, of uh, the world and the commercial part of the world that's operating. And we'll talk about it tonight, but we're going to show a film tonight. Uh, so we're going to show Tom Stoppard's Shakespeare in Rome. Uh, which I think is a wonderful uh, attempt to capture the very commercial basis of the Shakespeare, you know, the world Shakespeare uh, Belgium. So, in very competitive, uh, there were you know, usually about three major theater companies in England uh, during Shakespeare's uh, lifetime. Uh, and again, they were very competitive. Uh, they were always looking for new talent. Uh, and that's one of the key uh, to Shakespeare's life story uh, and to the story of the whole world. Uh, the theater attracted talent because it was a world that rewarded talent uh, at a time where talent wasn't all that rewarded throughout society. I mean, uh, uh, Shakespeare's world uh, was emerging from what we call feudalism, uh, an era when most people were born into the station of life that they were going to stay in. Most people in Shakespeare's uh, lifetime uh, stayed in the social rank, economic rank they were born in. Uh, if your father was a blacksmith, you became a blacksmith. That's why we have the name Smith, most popular in our language. Because uh, many of our names uh, refer to the occupation uh, 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 the name Cooper, for example, as I put wheels together, uh, the name Taylor. So, I mean, uh, 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 Shakespeare's world was not a world of great economic and social mobility. Uh, it was more so than England had been, but one of the chief routes uh, to upward mobility, in this say, was a theater. And you can see that because it attracted. Uh, a lot of people from the university. <laughs> then is now uh, people would go to a university and end up unemployable uh, as, a, as a result. Now, in some cases, uh, yeah, you see uh, uh, the Elizabethan age was a great age of doctors, of lawyers. Shakespeare's plays reflect that. He knows the lingo of doctors, he knows the lingo of lawyers, probably met them at the senior, picked up the vocabulary. Uh, uh, and yeah, it was already the beginning uh, of the modern world of professionalism. People would go get education and then maybe work their way up to court and so on. But that was pretty hard work. You know, that's not like striking a glitch in Hollywood. Yeah. And so indeed, uh, what the Elizabethan theater meant in Shakespeare's day is much what Hollywood meant uh, to a lot of the 20th century and what television has come to mean. I remember I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. I was class of 66. I remember there was one kid in our class who wanted to go to Hollywood. And we thought this was the craziest idea we'd heard of. This is the Kennedy era. You know, you went to Harvard because you wanted to become president or become your advisor president. But there was this one kid that wanted to become a movie maker. His name was Tim Hunter, actually. And he went on to make the movie including a movie called Pax and a movie called Riverdale. And so, and so, but I remember we thought this crazy thing. And then I remember I stayed at Harvard. I was a professor there for a while. Uh, and people were, but by the 1970s, people were interested in going to television. 
I mean, so that was the absolute stupidest idea that we've ever heard of. Uh, well, we didn't know it was, you know, Conan O'Brien with a couple of slots uh, down to the classes that the entire Simpsons group was about to go over and take over uh, uh, television comedy and so on. Uh, and I remember one of the late 70s when the people were saying Zednik was writing musical comedy. He went on uh, to write Mulan and some other things for Disney. And still, at any given point, and this is young people, uh, one of the wrong people make sure you know they look at this is where's the money coming from and where is it coming from in culture. Uh, you know, uh, today would seem to be to be video games. We talked about that at the end of the week. But in fact, you're saying one of the things you could do to rise in the world was the theater. And you can see the pattern again and again. Uh, Chris Romalo is a Cambridge a graduate, I think uh, Ben Johnson is a famous graduate. It is interesting that most of the other playwrights in Shakespeare's day uh, uh, were university graduates. Uh, uh, and as I said, they actually seem to have held it against him uh, that he didn't have a university uh, education. But, you know, he proved them wrong. And there's even some indication in his early plays he was trying to show off that he actually was well educated, particularly in Latin. Among his earlier plays, he's got comedy of errors, uh, that's an imitation of Paulus's uh, Latin play, the Menechmai. He's got uh, Titus Andronicus, which is very much in the mode of a Seneca tragedy. Uh, he's, he's showing that he knows the Latin model uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. I think he was tempted with the fact that he hadn't gone uh, to university. But he was pursuing the course. Uh, that uh, an intelligent young man in his day would. Uh, 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 Peter London then was right in the fast lane, uh, as Hollywood has been to so many people uh, in the uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, and the, the financial award was pretty substantial, uh, 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 especially for someone who didn't have connections with court and really didn't have many other opportunities. The nice thing about the theater was, then and now, it was nothing about talent. You, could, you know, if you could act well and bring in the audiences, you were in great shape. If you could write a play that people like, you were in great shape. Uh, it's hard to uh, translate uh, finances into modern terms. Uh, but I think the figures are roughly like this, that a playwright could be paid five pounds for writing a play when he could live for a year on ten pounds. And it was like, you know, you could get a lot of money in real terms for writing a play. You don't quote me exactly on those figures, but, it, you know, it would be like getting $50,000 per trip now. I know it sounds ridiculous to say, the monetary, the novel amount is so low, but you can find inflation for that. Uh, uh, but uh, the playwrights were, were well rewarded, and of course, in Shakespeare's case, he became a shareholder in the theater company. He, he was so important to his success uh, that uh, uh, they let him buy into the, uh, the company itself. I believe he was the only playwright who was a shareholder in one of the, uh, the, the companies. So he had uh, a real financial stake, and he became a very wealthy man. Uh, in the, uh, I mean, basically, he was from a lower middle class family. Fortunes uh, uh, of his family went up and down. Father was an affected mayor in Stratford at one point, but then suffered business uh, reversing. But he, he made enough money to buy eventually the second biggest house in Stratford. Uh, and owned a lot of land in Stratford. Uh, and he invested in some London property uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, again, it's hard to translate this uh, into modern terms, but he became uh, he was quite successful financially, and every indication is that he wanted, uh, uh, wanted to be. Uh, now, to say, again, it's, it's hard for us to recapture the status of writers in that day, because we, again, we projected back this idea that here's this great writer Shakespeare, uh, and everybody must have been aware of him as a great writer. 
But a better way to think about it is that playwrights and censors say have more or less the status of screenwriters today. Most people are unaware of who the screenwriters of movies are. I mean, most of them know who the screenwriter from the Wind was or the Wizard of Oz. You know, Citizen Kane, you know, was Orson Welles. He was also the director. But most people are not aware of who the screenwriter is. And you almost never can sell a film on the basis of who the screenwriter is. The films are very far oriented. You know, people want to go see the latest Brad Pitt movie or the latest Ezra, as they would go in movies. They they don't want to see the latest Joe Essar, especially Hal Jordan. I mean, there's a brief period, for example, when Essar was hot, and and you know, you'll occasionally see, you know, films are sold on stars. You'll occasionally see from the producers who brought to American Pie to I don't want to that actually brings anybody in. You know, maybe Jerry Bruckheimer, let's say a Jerry Bruckheimer production. But, you know, basically you sell films uh, on the start, and that's probably the true in Shakespeare's day, that the actors were the most famous. Uh, uh, the two most famous serious actors were a man named Edwin Allen, who worked for Marlowe, the company Marlowe was associated with, and Richard Burbage, who worked for the company. Shakespeare's associated with lots of some famous comedians. I'll talk about them in a minute. And I think the feeling, we don't know. We don't really don't know how to play to advertise uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, but but I have a feeling that people went to uh, see the latest Richard Burbage production. Or a deal is something called Hamlet this year. You know, he was so great that he received it. That's what Brutus, uh, uh, whatever that was called. Uh, but it is, so people were not aware of even who were writing these plays. Well, I think it's just that Shakespeare was so good that he seems to have been the first main playwright of the time. Uh, and also a book on the subject, the one I recommended, uh, Lucas Earn, Shakespeare's Literary Dramatist, really is a breakthrough book in re understanding what Shakespeare is all And he makes the point, he tells you that. Uh, uh, when Shakespeare's plays were first published, his name didn't even appear on the title page uh, in the early 1590s. So it was, you know, say the tragedy of Richard III or whatever. At a certain point in the 1590s, they stopped putting his name on the title page. Uh, as if they realized he's marketable, Shakespeare's marketable. And it does seem, uh, early on, this book is revolutionary because he argues that Shakespeare's plays uh, uh, were intended to be printed. You know, the, the, the common view is that Shakespeare had no interest in publishing his plays, uh, uh, and that uh, it was just lucky that uh, we happened to have uh, some texts that were illegally uh, printed and then were published in the first folio in 1620 by his friends. Uh, Ernst says this is just a mistaken assumption. He, he, he comes up with a very elaborate argument uh, that Shakespeare's theater company uh, had a project essentially branding Shakespeare. Uh, you know, you could like Stephen King. You can sell a movie on the Stephen King name. So it's always Stephen King is whatever. And so it is like Stephen King is whatever Stephen King is kind of. Uh, but but uh, uh, it does seem that, you know, he argues that you start to see Shakespeare's name appearing as if they, the company realizes this can help sell the play. And it's very interesting that uh, the, the whole notion of the commercial advantages of the game uh, uh, it is probably true that by 1600 people were thinking, oh, I hear Shakespeare has a new play at the Globe. It's called King Lear. Let's go to see it. A fellow is so good. Uh, now, again, we can't see this. We don't have contemporary reactions to each other, but a lot of the evidence shows that people were beginning to notice Shakespeare's name in a way that they weren't noticing other names. 
and then Thompson says to Christian Morrow, uh, and then Ben Johnson comes along. He was the first guy who definitely took his own place, and his name is bigger than the title of the play. Uh, uh, and so it's an interesting moment, very important moment in literary history when the author of the play starts to emerge as important. Uh, that's the understand that, you know, we were very much obsessed with the notion of, again, the single solitary genius, remember, uh, uh, sitting up in the attic, writing a play. Uh, you know, uh, most uh, English Renaissance plays were much more like screen plays in that they had multiple authors. This is unusual in that uh, he seems to have written most of his plays himself. Uh, by himself. But there are actually signs, many of them may be, not I mean, some of them may be collaborations. Uh, increasingly, people uh, find the hand of Thomas Middleton in his set, maybe some, maybe kind of Athens. Uh, uh, it's always been clear that Shakespeare collaborated with John Fletcher towards the end of his career on a play called Two Noble Freedmen, which is for a long time was not a sign to take this kind of it just was clear it wasn't totally by him, but now increasingly is admitted to complete Shakespeare edition. Uh, Fletcher and Shakespeare had combined on Henry VIII. Uh, this was a more common pattern, just the way there was no movie with a single scene by the author. And in fact, the movies you see up there on the screen are a fraction of the people who actually wrote the film. Uh, 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 in fact, it's a huge deal of negotiations. Who gets green credit uh, for a film? Uh, uh, and, you know, Casablanca, which maybe we'll talk about with this. You know, uh, roughly nine writers have been identified with that, uh, the case, with that script, and more people keep coming out of the woodwork of the time they just think that they wrote to the degree of a huge deal of adventure. Well, that's the way Shakespeare's theater was. There's every indication, for example, uh, that uh, uh, Shakespeare's theater has, has a script doctor. You know, there are people uh, in the Hollywood movie, if they have a minute, they bring in somebody who's uh, uh, good at, at ending or good at copying. Here's another interesting point about the visual labor uh, that enters into culture in ways, you know, it's not supposed to. So the image of I uh, said this morning that the whole of culture would only be possible in the case of traditional labor. But even within all, we are so uh, entranced by this theory of the single creator that we don't realize that division of labor is a, a principle. Uh, in, in Hollywood, there are certain, there are never a certain joke on you. I mean, you've got a film and the set is screening. And it's just dying in front of and the studio decides this is the joke. And they bring in so that he's known as a joker. He wouldn't want him writing the whole film. He can't do it, but what he's expecting is that he's getting just the right joke, so it's important. But someone else is perfect at writing ending. That's right beginning in the middle. But knowing how to end the film. Or writing is a very specialized art in Hollywood. And there, again, we don't have the kind of records that would tell us this in detail, but there's three key indications that, you know, start, like with Marlowe's back to Fauci, it's almost certain that that play we have is not completely uh, by Marlowe. And I think some guy was brought in to add drugs to it, probably not in Samuel Rowley. Uh, uh, and there, you know, uh, uh, the, every indication we have is that. The way these plays were written uh, was more the way films were written than the way we think of plays being written. Uh, you know, when Gino Neal wrote a play, the guy says that Gino Neal wrote the whole play. I'm not even sure if that's true in certain cases. Uh, but in Shakespeare's day, uh, we're seeing a, a, a collaborative effort dictated by commercial needs uh, in the play. And yeah, now, one view of this would be that this ruined the play. Uh, that the authentic genius uh, of one author's vision got corrupted. And in the case of Marlowe's process, seems to be the case. Uh, 
where the comedy scenes do not seem to be written on the level of inspiration as the great private scene. But that, on the other hand, may be just the point that they create a very interesting counterpoint between comedy and five minute poems. Is it a great debate in, uh, about Dr. Faustus? Uh, do the uh, comedy scenes ruin it or, or improve it? Uh, but I want to suggest that we see the two options are there. Sometimes the collaborative nature of the play may have messed them up. Sometimes uh, it, it, it may uh, have improved them. Uh, so again, Shakespeare was so talented that it seems that he could get away with, with, with writing uh, uh, pretty much the whole play himself. But that was fairly unusual. And many of the plays we know to be uh, collaborations by like two, sometimes three uh, authors. And again, they were not necessarily the worst for that. I said, you know, Shakespeare says, you know, uh, uh, Shakespeare was pretty sober, they need a few poverty scenes in it. They didn't have to bring in Sandra Lowe to fill out Shakespeare. He had the right comedy to just write down with. So, uh, but I, I use the analogy to Hollywood so that you can see that uh, this was a more complicated system with Renaissance playwriting and theater in general, and one that could, uh, in many ways, uh, lead to what makes the play uh, great. Here's another example uh, of how Shakespeare is working in a kind of active commercial theater environment. Shakespeare uh, uh, was himself an actor, we you know that. Uh, uh, he was a, not the star of the company. Uh, there's no hard evidence that there are legends that say he played Hamlet's father's ghost that he may have played the character who was sort of an Adam and as he was it. He was a big player, maybe a character actor, not a star of the way Burbage uh, uh, was. So we, uh, we know something about his theater company and, and uh, and he worked with it. Uh, a good indication uh, is the matter of comedy. Uh, we know the two principal comedians uh, that uh, uh, Shakespeare worked with. Uh, the first was a man named Will Kent, and the second was a man named Robert Arnold. Uh, uh, Will Kent uh, was the comic lead in the first half of Shakespeare's career in the 1590s. Uh, and probably created roles like uh, Belvedere, Much Ado About Nothing, Lancelot, uh, 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 Coburn, Mercy of Venice, and so on. And we can infer from this and from independent uh, evidence uh, that Kent was good at dancing, and something called Kent did, very famous. He was still a dance across half of it on a publicity stunt. Uh, he was always a good dancer, and he ever done is these great little comic dialogues with himself. Uh, he can talk to himself. And, and, and Shakespeare wrote parts for this guy, and you can see that the comic part uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the early comedies are written with Kent in mind. <laughs> Again, in typical Hollywood fashion, Kent decided it was too big for Shakespeare's company. He could go off on his own and start his own company and get a big star. And it was David Caruso. <laughs> uh, 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 and he actually did okay. But he was then replaced by a man named Robert Arnold, who was evidently very funny, but a different kind of humor. He had a good voice, he could sing. Uh, and Shakespeare, many of the players shift from writing parts for clowns to writing parts for fools. Uh, uh, Touchstone uh, in uh, uh, Twelfth Night, uh, excuse me, Touchstone as you like it, Best Day uh, in Twelfth Night, and above all, the two in the uh, And, you know, this is also a major change in what Shakespeare is doing dramatically, culminating in one of the most brilliant ideas in all world drama of adding the part of this. Kind of cool to the most tragic play I've ever written to me uh, And, you know, if you were just, if you knew nothing about theater history, we could say, you know, Shakespeare's a tradition, he was a genius. But 
looking at the fact, you can't help saying that this was an artifact of a change in the senior company, uh, that Robert Alvin had replaced Bill Kent. Uh, uh, well, it doesn't make sense to enough of a genius because, you know, there were other people in the senior company, and they weren't like the team leader. And they want to come up with brilliant ideas of who would be real. It's still the case to do it. Nevertheless, you can see that he was working with a man in the field of war, in certain constraints, just as, uh, you know, John Ford, uh, the 20th century one. You know, he knew the actors, he, he had this acting company that John Wayne was going to be in the uh, film, that uh, uh, Will Bond was going to be in the film. He had these character actors. Uh, and he always was creating parts for them. And it's one of the reasons these films are so great uh, uh, is that Ford had a great working relationship with his actors. He knew he could write parts for them and they played them perfectly. That, you know, when he wanted the sidekick, Andy Devine was waiting there to fill the role. Well, I'm saying the stage here was, was similar in that respect. And again, the fact that he worked in a commercial field environment meant that he made easy decisions not on what we would call purely aesthetic ground. He didn't say, I have to have a, you know, I have to have a senior in two years, let's go out and hire someone to do it. No, it probably worked the other way. I got Robert Armand here. He was so, he was so great in Azulizer. He was so great in Trotman. What can I do for him? I'm going to write him a part like, you know, you've never seen before. It'll have an incredible take on So, uh, and that's a sort of accident of theory history, but the result is one of the greatest, or probably the greatest drama ever written, and one of the greatest folks of genius in that uh, drama. So, this is the case where, you know, uh, in the abstract, and people who have contempt for commercial theater uh, would say, uh, what's worse than having the actors you're working with dictate? The kind of parts you write your plays. And Shakespeare would say, I don't know what I'm doing, even though I can live with it. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, this, all this I'm um, saying has bearing on the famous question of Shakespeare's authorship. Uh, I haven't made the movie thought, but I'm sure someone will, and I'll still call this. Uh, you know, there are all these crazy theories that Shakespeare uh, didn't write uh, uh, his plays, and uh, one of the a prominent candidate uh, uh, is the Earl of Oxford, uh, wrote the play, and Bert Fulbright, who's a great friend of the UG student, and I've met him here. He and I had a uh, very vicious exchange in the Weekly Standard when I did a negative review of his book, in which he earlier said he was a claim that the Earl of Oxford wrote the play. I, I bring it up because the issue actually was thought reflects his anti commercial prejudice. Uh, uh, the argument against Shakespeare having written uh, these plays is how could this uh, lower middle class uh, kid from rural Stratford who never went to a university uh, write uh, these great plays? It must have been an aristocrat. Uh, I had a great, I had a great fun with this program that Susan was doing Marxist because his argument was so class based uh, that uh, middle class people couldn't have written this place, only an aristocrat could have written this well uh, about aristocrats. Uh, it's interesting, we had a actually a pretty civil exchange of letters. Uh, uh, and then the miracles of all miracles happened. Uh, Falcon Heston came to my defense. Uh, uh, wrote a letter to the Weekly Standard uh, saying, I don't know much about the real Shakespeare, but I know one thing, he was an actor. And the man who wrote these plays was an actor. And he really was a brilliant letter, very learned, scholarly, uh, and really insightful. Well, the whole charge is how could some ignorant actor have written these plays instead of this uh, well educated uh, Earl of Oxford, which is a fact. And Hester said, you know, the one thing you can tell from these plays, and he said, after the acting you know, is that the guy who wrote these plays knew something about acting. That if you wanted to choose one profession 
for the guy who wants to say, oh, you can always say, he must have been a lawyer, he must have been a doctor, he must have been this, this, that. You know, that's really tough for us. You know what? He must have been an athlete. Uh, he knows so well how to write calls for athletes. And so, this, you know, Heston had this idea that, that, you know, safety grew out of a world of a fear, a commercial world. And it's so interesting to me to see that this, this prejudice against commercial art even stands to the most effective hours. But how can you give this lower middle class figure who must have been an aristocrat? Only an aristocrat could produce his life. That's what I want. Now, the answer to that is, you know, if we saw that every other Elizabethan and Jacobean dramatist was an aristocrat, and Shakespeare was the one anomaly, we could say maybe we've got argument here, but every one of these other play almost everyone, let me say that, uh, is from lower middle class audience. Uh, ben Johnson's father was a brick uh, uh The kid with the business, Shakespeare's uh, father was a glove maker, uh, and Marlowe's father was was also a, 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 a uh, I don't think generally uh, the, the pattern you see is that these playwrights of this time were on the move. <laughs> uh, in fact, when you go through the history of art, whether it's painting, music, uh, literature, there are very few aristocrats who could choose anything in the art. Uh, aristocrats don't have to choose anything. They're born to their wealth and their favor. And they typically rest on the law. Uh, it's precisely people from the middle class who have something to do, and almost all the things you see in the art are people who have very middle class motivations, and therefore, you say, commercial motivations. They, they, they want to make money and be successful and make something out of themselves in the classic capitalist uh, land for which stories. And so, I mean, again, even I think this, this great commemorative of Shakespeare's uh, 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 origins and whether he really wrote the play, we can actually reinterpret the light of John Fay here. Uh, uh, that the logic of the situation is he dictates that uh, a young kid from Stratford uh, uh, would be likely to produce this phenomenon, someone very ambitious uh, trying to make something of himself in the world. Uh, now, I don't want to uh, overstress this too much. Um, uh, the positive aspect uh, of the commercial character picture here. So let me qualify it. And again, one of the things I'm doing over today and tomorrow is suggesting how the patronage and, and commercial system blend, overlap, uh, sometimes in tension, sometimes reinforce each other. Um, there are significant signs that Shakespeare was not entirely comfortable with commercial theater. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, in the words of the Godfather, uh, this is the life he chose. I think he understood that this is what he pursued, uh, and he pursued it uh, very successfully. But I think he had doubts, uh, and we see this in many ways. For one thing, he did seek out patronage uh, at a number of points in his career, uh, as if he was just testing the water uh, for the other. Uh, in life. That is, uh, it does appear that he's born in the theater, uh, but the uh, plays was a problem in those days, and when plays broke out in London, uh, they often shut down the theater, sometimes, I believe, for as long as a year and a half. And it does seem that in the 1590s, uh, when Shakespeare uh, was not writing uh, able to write plays, he completely shut down, he wrote poetry. Uh, super elegant, mellifluous Elizabethan poetry. Uh, the Wake of Recluse and Venus and Adonis, two extremely learned, high culture poems with references to Ovid and uh, obviously the Roman uh, antiquity. They were exactly what people thought of as literature in those days. Plays were not thought of. Uh, as literature. So again, they were sort of roughly the way people think of TV scripts now. We weren't sure who the authors were, they didn't think they'd laugh. Uh, there's reason to think that Shakespeare worried that uh, his name would not become immortal if he simply wrote poems. 
As I said, when he started writing plays, they didn't even put his name on the playbook. And they didn't put it on public version of the play. So there was time uh, that he was considering the author's route. He was a great poet, uh, uh, of writing poetry and dedicating it to the Earl of Southampton. Uh, uh, very wealthy, upcoming, uh, uh, young man, even associated with the Earl of Essex, one of the most prominent uh, uh, young nobles. Uh, and <laughs> the dedication to social in the way that early to Renaissance uh, efforts to get patronage can be. You do not know what sucking up can do to be read a uh, dedication to a re- Renaissance uh, noble. Uh, and, you know, it's ob- obvious Shakespeare was trying uh, to get a position in Southampton's court. There's some indication that Southampton uh, did uh, help him out at various points in his claim interaction to see Shakespeare's company and you know, the career of Southampton and the career of Essex and, and so on. Uh, so it does seem that he, he was keeping his options open and trying to open up the options uh, uh, of, uh, of doing patronage uh, from uh, a prominent uh, a novel. Uh, and as I said, the, the career of Shakespeare's company was not entirely divorced from aristocratic or eventually world company. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the, the Globe Theater was built in uh, 1598 or 99. Uh, in the early 1600s, uh, the, uh, uh, the company uh, uh, opened up a new world theater, the Blackfriars, uh, which had a more upscale kind of park, uh, uh, they could more, uh, and generally uh, attracted a more aristocratic audience. You see this pattern in general in the period, uh, that there was not a simple divorce between uh, uh, the commercial theater and the kind of uh, aristocratic audience. This is even clearer in Ben Johnson's career, uh, Johnson, who, who, who uh, uh, worked for Perry, Shakespeare Company, Shakespeare was do more often in one of Johnson's plays. Uh, their career is intersected at many points. Uh, but Johnson uh, eventually made uh, the bulk of his money in writing court pageants uh, for James the First. And again, there was a, if you could be successful at court, there was a, you got these nice lump sum payments, and eventually Johnson got a pension from the team. So, again, I, uh, Johnson is typical of what was going on, but people pursued all their options. Just as now, people who work in the commercial world of art also seek out government grants, if they can get and sometimes patronage uh, uh, as well. It's kind of interesting when you look at the 20th and some 20th century artists oh, that will take money wherever they can get it. Uh, but in, uh, so in Shakespeare's case, uh, as well, there seemed to be signs that he, he was looking uh, uh, to get patronage when he said, There are signs to me that he was uncomfortable uh, with the world of the theater. You see it particularly in some late plays, in Evan Cleopatra, uh, maybe the last probably Shakespeare wrote, when Cleopatra is qualified with the prospect of being caught by Octavian, you know, he commits suicide, saying he doesn't want to be led uh, in trying to Rome by Octavian and see, you know, pageants put on uh, about her career. And she said she doesn't want to see someone uh, bore my greatness in the posture of a whore. Because so, again, boys play women in the Elizabethan uh, theater. And so she imagines what's exactly happening for us before our eyes. Where I can turn to a saying, I don't want to be up on a stage. Uh, and of course, Paul Lewis, the state of the at the same time, 1607 or 809, and at that period, uh, there was a whole thing was about the two of us who plowed to run an election campaign in Rome and, and keep uh, saying things like a bell after I forgot my card. He just hates the idea of appearing uh, uh, before a crowd and regards the whole world of the theater uh, as somehow. Uh, corrupting to the soul. You know, I, my guess is that Shakespeare was a sensitive guy. Uh, 
And, you know, that the world of commercial theater is rough on him. And that, you know, having to be an actor was tough on him. Uh, and dealing with this whole commercial world was a strain for him. All the compromises involved, all the having to work with uh, other playwrights and with the owners of the company. Well, he was a co owner, but uh, the manager of the company working with the actors. It just was difficult. I don't know, the oddest thing about Shakespeare is he was hired. Uh, Probably 1610, 1611, goes back to Stratford. Uh, you know, uh, at the peak of his powers, uh, he's still writing things like the Tempest. Uh, there's no sign uh, of any feebleness in his powers. It does seem as if uh, he pushed away enough money and owned enough land that I don't need this anymore. My own personal theory is that he went home to prepare an edition of the play. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, a very controversial idea. Again, the most common view is that uh, Shakespeare is only resistant to the publication of plays. I cannot believe that. I can't believe that if I lived in King Lear, I wouldn't want it to be preserved and in as good a copy uh, as it could be. And I'm glad to say, finally, some scholars are coming around to the same view, earn. Uh, makes the point that uh, Sammy Wells and his book takes for all time. Uh, points with some interesting facts that uh, in, in Shakespeare's year, uh, there are three legacies, uh, 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 one to uh, uh, Richard Berger's, one to uh, John Henry's, and one to Henry Tomba. Uh, uh, Henry Tomba went on to publish Shakespeare's plays in the famous first of 1623. Uh, and it, uh, we have Shakespeare's plays in rather bad text, but better than we might have hoped. And my guess is, and, and other scholars now support this, is that, that Shakespeare was talking to these friends uh, about publishing uh, his work and maybe even, you know, preparing the idea that if he died, they would finish the project. Uh, Burbage died before the first folio came out. But it, it, there are little indications like that. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the text with some of Shakespeare's plays are still very good. Some are still very bad. But so things like the Tempest, Cornelius, and the Catastrophe have very good text. And my guess is Shakespeare has sat down and started to prepare good text. Uh, unfortunately, died. Uh, he was only 54 when he died. Uh, 52? Uh, 52. 52. Uh, so he could have expected to live longer, but that was pretty early for his day. Uh, but uh, uh, again, this suggests that he was uh, not indifferent to the state uh, of his uh, work. Uh, going back to the point I started to make, uh, uh, if you look at certain signs in Shakespeare's work, he was not entirely comfortable with the world of the commercial theater. I'm not saying that. Uh, again, the people that see Problems with the commercial character uh, of Peter are like undoubtedly Shakespeare had to do things uh, that uh, he didn't want to. It's interesting, for example, uh, a couple of his plays have have tantalizing titles. How do you like it? Talk about the subtitle of What You Will. As if Shakespeare is saying to his audience, okay, this is what you want, here it is. Uh, He's written The Merchant of Venice, which is an unusually dark comedy, an unusually complex one, one which uh, borders on tragedy, and, and some feel has a strong tragic element. Maybe it didn't go so well. <laughs> Shakespeare says, the next thing he's writing is, as you like it, what you will, must you do about nothing? As if he's saying, you know, my comedy is too serious for you, I can write this trivial stuff uh, for you. Uh, or, uh, uh, you know, Soylent and Cressida, uh, my guess is it's bomb. <laughs> Some kind of weird experiment that uh, uh, never succeeded. You know, you look at the conversation between Hamlet and the players, uh, you see that they're there, Shakespeare's very into the whole business of theater companies and the rivalry, and he, you know, he must have felt rivalry. He was the first Christopher Marlowe, he was Ben Johnson, 
Ben Johnson was always taking pot shots at first year. Uh, Clay was roaming plays, weren't roaming enough, and Clay made a mistake in his plays. So, uh, 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 and so it was a very competitive environment that takes the operator uh, uh, in. And my guess is, yes, it was a strain on him. Uh, uh, and yes, at the time, he felt pressured into doing things uh, that he might not have wanted to do. You know, there's this famous legend uh, that uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth liked the character so fast so much that she wanted to see him in love, and Shakespeare had to write the comedy, uh, 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 Mary Wise Windsor. Uh, 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 you know, it's almost like when, when poor uh, 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 Sherlock Holmes was to come. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle had a kill-off, Kelly had a kill-off for that home, so he could go on to write other things, uh, and, and he, he couldn't, the public forced him uh, to, to resurrect for that home. Well, they just pulled off full staff in Henry V, and maybe he thought, thank God, I'm done with that guy, don't want to write any more full staff plays in any but forced his wife, Mary Rice I have no doubt that he felt the pressure of working in the intensely competitive world of commercial theater. But I also think he was a better playwright for it. Uh, that uh, uh, he, he knew uh, the theater company was writing for, and he knew his audience. Uh, and I guess he was there every night in the theater, maybe acting in the play or, 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 or standing backstage. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it meant his play is one of the things that they did wrong. Now, again, there were probably a hundred other playwrights at the time, and all in the same commercial environment and all under the same pressure that takes your opportunity. So that doesn't explain the genius. Uh, 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 you know, if, if this explains the genius, uh, then uh, the plays of Thomas Becker ought to be a lot better than they are. Uh, 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 not that the two-maker part of is all that bad. Uh, but uh, again, if I'm talking about a necessary knowledge of certain conditions. Uh, I do think, however, that the whole world Shakespeare operated was uplifted by this, by the competitive pressure. You really see what it is to have the city of London with, you know, any given moment, probably three major theater companies uh, 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 where everyone's competing uh, for the public attention, for the public money. It energized uh, two or three generations of writers, uh, and they all lifted each other up, and Shakespeare really lifted them up. You know, there's a tendency here among most great professors to study uh, the influence of other dramatists on Shakespeare. Well, it's an even more fascinating question to raise the question of Shakespeare's influence on his contemporaries, because, you know, it was like, uh, you know, a great Hollywood director. Uh, uh, people see a John Ford Western, uh, 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 and then uh, someone else uh, uh, can do a Western much better than he could have if there hadn't been the example of John Ford or Hitchcock's influence uh, on, on thrillers. Uh, 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 one thing that happens in this kind of intense competitive environment is people do imitate each other. And Shakespeare undoubtedly learned something from Marlowe, for example. The, the very sound of his black bird is inherited uh, from Marlowe, but he, he went beyond. Model. But in, in, in general, when we look at this period, uh, with maybe the absolute peak of the drama in the Western tradition, truly one of our highest peaks, uh, it's not because uh, it was non commercial. It's not because these playwrights were shielded from competition. Uh, 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 if you look, and again, you can't. Shakespeare is such a genius, he might have succeeded in any environment. We'll talk about this when we get to someone like Chuck Nicole operating under scholar in the Soviet regime. And even he is able to achieve great things under the worst possible conditions. We'll see if he was on a Shakespeare based opera he wrote, uh, Lady Macbeth, 
but uh, in, in, so, I mean, in some ways, what's interesting is how a commercial environment can lift all boats. Uh, uh, that the richness of the trade uh, has to do precisely with the fact that the exact patterns you get in a commercial theater of people imitating, following the lead, and the sort of things that make Shakespeare's theater look like the modern world of commercial theater is, for example, Shakespeare. I didn't write Henry the first part two. Now it's very possible with the two plays I think that in fact plan at the beginning of uh like the three parts of the Lord of the Rings or the Pirates of the Caribbean sequence uh now. Uh but it is interesting that you find the same phenomenon that one thing succeeds and then everyone starts imitating it. Uh uh Hamlet helped kick off a sequence of revenge tragedy uh, in the Jacobean period, which is sort of uh, inaugurated. Uh, uh, these are commercial principles. Something to see other people start imitating it. Uh, now, the imitations of Hamlet, I'm not as good as Hamlet. There's a play uh, called The Revenge of Tragedy. Some people think it's by Middleton, some people think it's by Cyril Turner. Uh, there's no name on it, so it's a good example of you don't know who wrote it. But it's called The Revenge of Tragedy. Uh, it's marvelous to me to think what a sort of second rate, which means many other sort of first rate, but a second rate dramatist of Shakespeare's time, Sarah Hammond was about. Uh, 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 and it ends the metaphysical addition of human nature. It's about a rock and soccer revenge tragedy that everybody gets at the end. That's what, what whoever wrote that play saw on Hamlet. Uh, uh, I think it's a good play. It's actually, uh, to see it say, it's a really exciting play with some great moments and great dramatic uh, turns. Uh, uh, so, this is what I'm talking about when I say that uh, commercial theater is quite viable. Uh, that it's Shakespeare didn't succeed in spite uh, of the commercial world he operated in, and he didn't succeed because of it either, because again, we're talking about a level of genius here, which is actually unique in the history of the new age. But still, there are ways in which the very commercial character of the theater world he operated in fed his creativity. We will never know, you know, if he had been on government time or if he taught at a university where his salary was paid no matter what place he was, whether he would have gone through the effort to turn out two plays in the year. You know, it's very suspicious. People think he had a contract with Lord Fanning's name and he said two plays in the year. Because that's, that's what we see uh, in a pattern. Uh, to be basically to get to the I try to think of, you know, writing a fellow and seeing him in one year. That, that's quite the way it works out. I mean, that's a of achievement. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you didn't have a contract to do this, would you have done it? We'd like to think yes. Uh, but you'll see this in Shakespeare Love tonight. That, you know, the pleasure of the deadline, the fact that his money depended upon meeting the demands of the front company in order to republic. Sometimes you, you need that. If he's if you've been a solid professor of creative writing uh, at Oxford, who knows? He might have said, well, you know, we can, uh, we can wait to produce this, uh, this work. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm not in any way trying to demean Shakespeare uh, by suggesting that there was a commercial aspect uh, to his career. Uh, what I'm trying to do is actually uplift the notes of commerce in our minds that, that, that doing something uh, to make money to please the public is not an ignoble activity. Uh, and again, every indication we have is that Shakespeare was a fully commercial uh, artist. And if that's so, uh, it doesn't take Shakespeare down a peg, it lifts commercial art up. No mind. But if you understand that if he could grow out of the commercial uh, uh, atmosphere, then there's nothing inherently evil or demeaning about commerce uh, as a motive for art.
stop stop here. And now we've got a couple of minutes we're going to take some questions. Yes, I mean, it's, it's very operatic, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it is interesting that uh, uh, revenge is such a motive for the Italian opera. And it is. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's a. Uh, I, uh, uh, yes, I could probably one of his favorite authors. There's a famous passage about time of act and, and gold uh, that Marx uh, quotes. And, and uh, Satan was extremely famous in Germany uh, in the 19th century. And the uh, the uh, German translations of Shakespeare by Slade and Keith are among the finest translations of anything ever done. But, they're simply magnificent, they're accurate and they're beautiful. And so Shakespeare plays almost as well in German as he does in English. I just don't accept uh, in German and Frankfurt, and I can testify uh, uh, to this. And so uh, there was more Shakespeare scholarship in 19th century Germany than there was in 19th century England. Uh, it was a big deal. of Goethe loved Shakespeare, Schiller loved Shakespeare. And so Marx, who very much Marx to me is a German romantic. He grew up in the world of German romanticism and uh, his vision is utopian in the way that German romanticism was. He claimed it was anti utopian and scientific, but that makes it all the more utopian. So Marx, uh, you know, he really is the disaffected literary intellectual. So, uh, I mean, you know, one of those good points about it is that he writes uh, uh, Shakespeare. They were often for the, often for the wrong reason. Uh, but it has a, you know, there's a, uh, uh, there's quite a, a significant body of Marxist scholarship on Shakespeare, which takes off from the fact that the great man uh, was Shakespeare, and therefore, uh, even in the Soviet Union, there was uh, actually some very good. Uh, uh, Marx of course is in Shakespeare in the 1930s. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 Yeah, uh, it's a complicated point because Ben Johnson, for example, for all his quibbling about Shakespeare, knew he was a much greater artist. Uh, it's one of these quibbles about it. And of course, in the poem that preparatory to the first uh, poem, says it was not an age for a long time. And, uh, uh, I know exactly what he's talking about, and it is important to realize uh, that Shakespeare was regarded as a especially a pop culture figure. But what's also true is that already in the time people were beginning to realize who the Jews. Again, this fact that Francis Mears already in 1598 was comparing him to the ancient uh, uh, Jonathan. So it's not simple. I mean, you know, his, his reputation is complex uh, as to uh, begin with. But you're right that Beaumont and Fletcher are who were basically successful commercial artists, uh, uh, were more popular on the 17th century stage uh, than Shakespeare. Uh, Johnson, not so than Shakespeare, but rather respected. And uh, uh, it is interesting that these playwrights, there's a, except for the Puritan intellectual, there's uh, something of a continuity in, in all the production throughout the 17th and 18th century. But yes, yeah, uh, when Shakespeare, by the end of the 18th century, he's starting to be held up uh, as this genius who can be totally divorced from his origin, above all, in the commercial theater world. People are beginning to forget that that was a commercial uh, theater. He's starting to be thought of as an elite figure, high culture, and then the romantic. He becomes 
uh, the great image uh, of the perfect creator. Uh, and, you know, he is. I mean, he's the greatest genius I think that ever lived. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and again, you, you can see his differences from the other playwrights that he, he really didn't really have the most patience and could write the plays or all aspects of them uh, on his own. But he does increasingly get copied so that ultimately we can get to that kind of quote as a bad one that Shakespeare wouldn't have written the plays he did if he was for the commercial theater and people just completely forget uh, his origins. Yeah, I, I've never read the books or seen the movies, so I think that the comment on Harry Potter, but I only saw it up and heard he's about to kill him off. Uh, I don't have faith in Paul Staff or Conan Doyle and, and Ron Holmes. Uh, I really have I mean, I've heard some people say good things uh, about those books. I've heard some people say some pretty nasty things about them. But it is, you know, I'll, I'll say this, that from Taylor's point of view, it's a phenomenon. I mean, it, it has some kind of power, what we call red in the business, uh, uh, and so I assume there must be something to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, my guess is that people condemning it are like we doing it from the outside, uh, and that people who actually have contact with it will read these books to their children or whatever, talk with their, just talk with their children about them, that there's probably something in there. Uh, now it hasn't. The, well, I guess some people they're not condemning because of the witchcraft and so they, Yeah, yeah, there's some. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> my 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 very very distant reaction to it is this is just the world of an English public school, which is a public school, and that would look so weird in our society. But as far as I'm concerned, it's just like uh, uh, any public school environment I've ever seen in England. Uh, <laughs> that's something I know nothing about. Uh, one more question? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I hesitate because this is so sensitive. But I will say this. What, uh, what's so important in a correlated system is the contempt for the mob. And the mob is portrayed very much as a theater organ. And I suspect that Shakespeare has a profound identification with that moment. Correlated is reluctant to expose himself naked to the crowd, probably gives us insight into the way Shakespeare felt when he got up on the stage. I mean, many actors will tell you this, that they are in private, very private people. Uh, Tony Carlson was a classic example of this. He was very shy and the time. But when he was on the screen, he lit up. And, you know, he was just for congeniality, uh, but in black. This is a great line. Sincerity is the most important thing in show business. If you can say that, you can say anything. So this was involved, you know, acting. And it's a, you know, some people are hands, so they just love getting up in front of audiences. Other people, you know, uh, have things done. I, my guess is that Shakespeare was one of these people who wasn't possible on stage, but forced himself to do it. And you see some signs of that. In and again, I'm, you know, what I'm thinking is, you know, here is the, uh, the, the greatest human genius who's ever lived. And he's got to get up in front of this crowd of groundlings and perform for them, knowing that they don't have a clue what his great stuff is about. Uh, and yet, you know, this is the life he chose. You know, this is how he earns his money. And he did it. He did it for 20 years. Uh, and send out play after play for these people, and by and large, they were mostly successful. 
Uh, and uh, 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 Walter Kaufman has this great line about Shakespeare. He knew how to give his pearls the uh, air of the sky before passing them before this line. Oh, only the German could say stuff like that about uh, Shakespeare. And I think it's a real insight that he knew how to succeed in the commercial theater, and there I suspect there was part of him that bought that and, 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 and hated it. And uh, um, uh, Stanley Wells, in this relatively new book, I think it's 2003, Shakespeare for All Time, the first person I've seen come up with a few uh, that Shakespeare loved Stratford as a way of getting away from the London theater. You know, there's a real paradox of his life. It seems as if he left his wife, his children, his whole home behind, spent 20 years in London, working with the theater, and then came back to Stratford. Wells points out, if you look at the records, there are a lot of things that play Shakespeare in Stratford during those years. Lawsuits, you know, buying a new house, getting it rebuilt and so on. Uh, and he speaks to his, to Shakespeare, because he told Shakespeare the first commuter artist, that he needed the sanctuary of Stratford to get away from the London theater world. And he even proposes to an agency that Shakespeare wrote his plays in Stratford. So he just how that whole he written his plays in the hustle and bustle of London. And he clearly said, you know, it was about a four or five day journey but he, from London to Stratford, but he has this idea that Shakespeare needed that retreat. He needed to be able to put distance himself between London and the London theater world and, and somehow the private world. Well, we have all no proof for that, but, but it's a fascinating theory. And again, if you try to get into the mind of this, you would be one of us can, because it's a mind that's so far beyond any of us, it's not even funny. But you know, the interesting thing that this is, uh, I mean, it's a man with such sensitivity uh, to human emotion. He could feel his way into any human being. It must have been bizarre for him to be among people because he was becoming them all the time. Must be incredible pressure. Uh, he needed his space. Then I thought, think while he's finding that I'm not already, I've made enough money, I've written enough great plays, I'm going home to Stratford, I'm going to turn them into books. Now I'm going to get, uh, and leave that theater world behind me. Uh, so, uh, and again, that's, uh, you know, that's just my gut reaction. But I think, you know, if you look at certain moments, uh, you can see it with Thomas, uh, where he's in some ways so embarrassed to be played before crowds and so I think it's really clear. But that is the rightest speculation. I don't, I'm not fantasy to say to you, I'm just projecting something. So, um, tomorrow we will pay for your music. Now, we're going to still take the love tonight here at 7 o'clock. Uh, uh, it won't be on the final. Uh, you don't have to feel about to come, but if you'd like to say, if you've never seen it, it's a great movie. It's like being here, but want to see it again. It's a great opportunity. And we'll talk about it a bit afterwards. You can you know, be a little more informal. The, the great internet audience won't be out there watching us as we do it. But I thought we, we'll try to have a movie every night at 7. Tomorrow night will be on the day. It will fit in with what we're doing uh, on uh, classical music. And then Wednesday, I'm going to show a set to film this film and prepare for what we're doing on Thursday. And then Thursday night, the high point, and prepare us for Friday morning lecture. We'll watch an episode of The Simpsons and an episode of The X-Files. Uh, and we'll see what truly great commercial arts in the